was asking if we were accepting it or if we were good with it. I actually have it open. Uh, what was that, David? I actually have it open, sir, and it's um stating that they have not heard from many of us and nothing will change with regards to your program, bail certification, faculty, completion date, tuition and benefits. Um, we need to let uh, Mr. Alonzo know whether or not we plan to transition to an ECB to continue our QSM program. So okay. he's talking about us being added to the transition list okay. to, um, that we will be contacted by a representative of NECB and so on and so forth and the platform that would be available as such and so on and so forth. I just wanted to know how that would, I mean, is that mandatory? It looks like it's a mandatory thing or um, might be or might not be. Yeah. Um my understanding and, and what they just told us uh, in the faculty briefing is that uh, nothing changes for you guys operationally, you know, in the way we're going to be doing the class. We'll still use Janzibar, which is the, the portal, the NGS portal. Uh, they have a different setup called Canvas. They don't use the same portal that we do. Uh, and I understand everything else from that standpoint. You know, I'll be with you. The, you know, the, the faculty that are scheduled are going to teach. Uh, the schedule is the same. Now, the issue, I think, is what your diploma says and whether you will have, you know, the uh, NGS, the National Graduate School of Quality Management, or uh, it will be uh, uh, from uh, any uh, CB, uh, the New England uh, College of Business. And uh, <clears throat> so that may be the issue there on your preference. but. Uh, uh, you know, there's pros and cons to that. One is that, uh, you know, you certainly went through the curriculum. You, this is now school is a part of their uh, a degree program. Uh, if you're going out and doing applications for jobs and still having, you know, this, this uh, you know, college has a very good reputation. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you refer back to that website. That's where you graduated from. So there's kind of a pros from that standpoint, if you want to consider it. I think if you do get a, 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 my understanding of the diploma is that you do have to apply, uh, you know, that you become enrolled. And it's what my understanding, like the faculty, we become employees of uh, NECB. And uh, so it's, it's a fairly painless process. But uh, uh, something that uh, I believe, you know, may be to your benefit. Uh, but I think you probably have to send something back to the registrar about your intent. You know that we yeah sign me up or NECB as a, a diploma or if you got any questions, but I haven't really been part of the, the student uh, aspect, so I don't want to talk out without any type of a, uh, previous information that I'm absolutely sure I can pass on to you. So I, I probably would think that uh, checking with the registrar may be the best course of action at this point. If you got any questions? Um, and also, they have other degree programs uh, that they offer there, and uh, there is a doctoral program. I'm not sure if any of you are considering uh, going on to, to get a DBA, a doctoral business uh, administration, and, uh, but they all offer that as well. And it's basically very similar to what NG, well, it actually is the NGS uh, version of it. They didn't offer doctoral uh, degrees uh, previously, so this is one of the benefits to uh, NECB uh, joining in with the uh, NGS. Okay. So, any other questions or, or comments, folks? Um, let me ask um, in, if um, uh, I think we talked about doing a, a team eval uh, last time. Uh, where are you with that? Yeah, were you able to sit down and have a discussion amongst yourselves about where you uh, were and uh, were you able to complete that? Uh, I thought we did that last time. Were we supposed to do another one? Oh, um, yes. Right? 
Who? Um, because last time we were missing two members of the in the survey, sir. You're talking about? Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. And um, well, we were um, we didn't really get a chance to include everyone as yet. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I really would like to know. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't been able to do that, I mean, that is one of the, the, the outcomes of that is for you to have a discussion amongst yourselves. And uh, particularly, uh, it seemed that, you know, comments that had an evaluation about sharing the workload and, and who does what within that. And I really would like for you as a team to have that discussion before we close this chapter out and I uh, do that. So uh, if you can get together and go through this process, of having that discussion around that eval, and I would like to have that consensus version of that evaluation. Now, I can give you some extra time on that if you haven't done that, but I want you, that that's a key element, and it's really not for the school as much. We kind of check progress. I kind of know where you are, but it's also really for you as a team, and, and just having that discussion going through with that and uh, going through that to see where you, you rated each other and where you think you want to change, in particularly for the last few uh, months that you have, of course. Uh, it's been my experience, things kind of get accelerated towards the end because you're bringing in the project into closure, you've got the last couple of courses. Uh, you're going to have to brief your champion on your findings, on your recommendations, and include those recommendations uh, before we graduate. So things kind of accelerate, and so if there's any, you know, things that you need to talk about, any flaws or fissures in your relationships or how things are working, uh, I really would like for you to do it at this point. And then uh, if you haven't had the chance for all of you get together and had that discussion, and it ought to be a discussion, not just a paper drill, uh, and do it at your next team meeting and, and send it in to me uh, after you have that. And then... Uh, because uh, I'm very much interested in uh, that aspect of your uh, of your learning. Okay. Uh, you start I with a new course. I'm sorry. I just said yes, sir. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, which uh, you start on Wednesday, right? Um, this week with new course. Sir, I believe so. Yeah, I think Dr. Lott, I mean, uh, Professor Lott, if I'm not mistaken, is it so? Okay. Uh, if you want, uh, if you would, and then any one of you discuss it tonight when you can do that, but uh, uh, when you do send it in, I'm going to be looking for the consensus thing in that, and uh, I'll give you a couple of more days on that before I do grading, but I really need to have it, you know, fairly quickly before I can close out the grades, because the DQs, as I mentioned, the discussion questions because of the holidays, uh, the travel, many of you, you know, uh, have families. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I know uh, NGS is probably 100% what you do, and that's what you live and breathe. But uh, if you're like uh, most of us, there are other re requirements. So really, the DQs, except for that first week, is the only requirement you had, uh, the team evaluation, and then uh, these two presentations. So it's, a, it's an important part of your grading. So I, I would like for you to guys to go ahead and finish that up. Um, and then um, uh, hopefully you had a chance to practice your presentation as you, as you went through. Uh, and uh, when you do your briefing after this, I'm gonna ask you about what you learned from either going through the practice, uh, did you learn anything from as you went through that uh, and listening to this, and uh, what you may have gained from that. So I'm going to be interested when we do our, at the end of the briefing, uh, you know, what uh, your reaction was when you did, went through that as a team. So, all right, those are really the introductory marks I had for you. Anybody have any other? Uh, okay. All right, and recording this, by the way, so we can, I can send a, and Matthew will get a copy of this. Uh, and here's the, the scenario. Uh, I'm going to just kind of be here quietly. Don't ask me for feedback. The only thing that may occur is that uh, uh, the slides may stick. In other words, uh, there may be a little bit of time of delay depending on how much capacity you have and your bandwidth on your uh, internet. 
and uh, or if there's a problem, in other words, we get stuck on it, and that has occurred occasionally, then we'll just stop and then we'll kind of restart the time. But I'm going to time this as well. And uh, so I'm going to have just listen to you, uh, go through that, and then at the end uh, we'll have comments. Uh, question. Uh, in flipping the charts, I can have one of you be the presenter or I can do it. Do you have a preference? I think it's okay if you do it, sir. Okay. All right. All right. I can handle that. Okay. Slide flipper. All right. So, are you guys ready? Okay. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to switch me off. Um, and so that you can concentrate on your uh, presentation. And. Um, the part that Matthew has, that's going to be handled. Uh, are you doing having a reader? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Great. And uh, it is 8.14 by my watch. So you may begin. Okay, this is Team Prom Aircraft. Um, this, this is our presentation. Our um, team members include Judith, Jay, Matthew, myself, and DeCaldo. Next slide. So this just, um, that one slide right there gave you an introduction of all the team members. Um, this slide is telling you about the people that we have been working with, um, our champion. His name is Lieutenant, Christopher, Lieutenant Colonel Christopher Dunson. Um, he is the commander of the Aircraft Maintenance Squadron. And a key thing to know about him is that he has the authority to ensure that any and all the resources are available. Um, we have been communicating with him through email given him updates and we have actually presented the presentation to him um, last year and we're getting ready to schedule to give him another briefing. Um, some of the other ones that we've had interaction with, well mostly Jay's had interaction with, would be Captain Mark Smith, the squadron officer, Chief Rouge, the squadron superintendent, Chief Alsquest, um, the aircraft maintenance superintendent, Sergeant Woods, the supply non-commissioned officer, and of course the rescue squadron and those will be talked more later on later on throughout the presentation next slide so this just kind of gives you a brief background um, about the 70, 72, 723 aircraft maintenance squadron um, there is about 350 plus personnel that work here. Um, they have a total of nine aircrafts, which are the C-130J Compact King II. Um, some of what they do is they support, transport, and drop of equipment and people to selected destinations. Next slide. I think I'm lighting. So this is just a slide showing the DMAIC model. Um, we're actually going to go through all of these. The first one, of course, is going to be the define stage, which we're going to show um, defining the problems and objectives, the problem statement, the problem objective, um, secondary metrics, process mapping, the plan, um, plans for change. Next slide. So we'll start with the defined stage. Some of the tools we use were, of course, problem statement, strategic planning, um, CRM, stakeholder registry, force field analysis. Next slide. So the defined stage, um, this is our problem statement. And, and let me find my other one. 
So in the define, we are wanting to define the problem, improvement activity, opportunity for improvement, the project goals, and customer internal and external re requirements. With that being said, um, the problem is that the aircrafts are having significant downtime that is greater than the 24 hours, which was due to the parts unavailability during unscheduled maintenance. Um, the downtime of the multiple aircrafts per day falls below the mandated 86%. So some of the course of actions, solutions, you okay? Sorry. Um, shortening the unscheduled aircraft maintenance turnaround time can help to enable at least one minimal flight time and to contribute to an increased capability rating. And to promote um, unit readiness, which would be ideally above that 86%. Next slide. Sir Judith, um, for this slide, our main goal um, for this MVP is to support the champion by providing with a providing him with a possible solution for the problem at hand. First, we have determined the root cause of the problem, um, which is the parts uh, missing parts of the of, uh, enabling the the aircraft to be fully mission capable. Um, we will focus on the, the, we have focused on the root cause in order to find the right solutions. Our hope is to be able to provide a streamlined process to enable the champion to meet his strategic goals. Slide, please. The CIPAC process map, um, this time right, right here, sir, shows, it pretty much shows a good summary of the parts procurement process as, as we see within the 7th or 23rd aircraft maintenance quadrant. And this, this map right here shows the complexity of the process within, um, with the many different players. It shows from the time that we're putting the supply demand through the suppliers and ordering the parts, which is the input, and the process going through and the output that we get with parts getting a, being available, being sent through, whether it's by mail or being sent to the main customers on post or the um, on, in the Moody Air Force Base supply maintenance in the 7 23rd. So this shows pretty much how complex the situation is, what we have at hand and how um, what we need to work on. Slide, please. The customer requirements matrix, um, we have gleaned that the most important to the customer is to get the aircraft off the ground and back into the fight up to be fully operational. In order to reach that capability, we need the parts to be 100% available, which has been the main problem or the biggest gap. So this shows what's um, important, the quality characteristics being availability of the parts, operationally, the aircraft being fully mission capable, and the time that we have with the uh, parts being delivered, um, being delivered on post, and us being able to go get it, or being it being shipped to the maintenance hangars, and um, where it ranks within what the customer finds being the most important to them. So right now we're ranking the operational, the aircraft being fully operational as the top most important piece for the customer, our champion, Lieutenant Colonel Dunstan. Slide, please. The stakeholder register highlights the level of influence of our champion and our day-to-day -day champions. Um, we need to get, of course, the buy-in from, from all of them, mainly the top, uh, the boss, the lieutenant colonel, who has the most influence within the unit. So definitely we need to build a strong, um, a strong plan of implementation for him and get the buy-in from him and hopefully seeing this thing, um, this plan successfully implemented within the unit and uh, providing them the the parts that they need and getting the aircrafts off the ground. The main thing that I would like to highlight also in this one is one of the ma major issues that we have is the civilian vendors that has been the um, one of the key 
issues, trying to understand their process and how they affect um, our own process. So with us understanding how they process the the parts once we order the parts from them and how they process it, sending it, sending it out, whether or not they have a priority list and we don't figure in that priority list, we need to get more familiar with their process in order to see whether or not we need to renegotiate our, our, um, our agreements with them, our contracts with them in order to for, for us to get the parts on time, delivered on time to our maintenance hangers. So Dowdy, AFED, Rolls Royce, oh, those are the main three that we definitely, once we understand their, um, their processes to see whether or not we can influence any change and getting um, the Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel behind us and pushing that change. Next, sir. The false field analysis provided us a framework to look at the factors that um, negatively affected or influenced the situation within the, um, the unit. We were able to determine the enable, enabling and restraining factors um, to the project and um, pretty much with um, the number system that we used, we, with a strong support from the champion, the enabling factors will work to our advantage. The restraining factors, we didn't see them as much of an obstacle because we're working against it. We're working to change the status quo and put um, break down the resistance in the process. It's hard to get people to accept change, but we know that having the champion support, we can definitely affect change and um, showing them how valuable our input is, how we can be better tested, the plan can be better tested. We can definitely see how uh, best to utilize it to their advantage, which at the end of the day, uh, their main goal is to get the aircraft off the ground, fully mission um, capable mission um, so we think that with the, the top one being getting the buy-in from the champion, getting his full support, we will be able to positively affect any restraining factors for the project. Next, sir. The next phase we will be going in over it will be the measuring phase, which Matthew and uh, Carlo will provide you with the briefing, sir. The tools we've used, process map, benchmarking, and data collection plan. So I will be followed by uh, De Carlo and Matthew. Thanks, sir. Next slide, sir. De Carlo and Matthew will brief. Um, the process map is a layout of the steps where the interaction between the suppliers, input, output, and customers occur that create the opportunity to create improvement. Um, going from the aircraft entering non-mission capable status due to a broken part, the potential routes of the part procurement process, um, whether on-site, on-base, or from the vendors and ending with the aircraft having the new part and entering fully mission capable status. Next slide, please. With the primary benchmarking, um, we represent the we present the potential benchmarking partners depending on the champion's interest. Um, the primary focus of the benchmarking, whether it is strategical or operational, for example, an interest in functional benchmarking would look to the recommendation that they look to the Army's A64 helicopter program. Next slide, please. We have a list of secondary benchmark resources to offer our champion. For example, the Carlo found an article that deals with the benchmarking contract management within the US Navy. We feel that it will be a resource for improving Air Force 
vendor relations. Next slide, please. The data, uh, the data collection plan was put together with the goal of obtaining quantitative data as well as qualitative data in the form of the survey. Next slide, please. Um, now moving to the analyzed phase of the DI process, uh, the tools we use include the Pareto chart, the fishbone, the five wires, and the current value stream map. Next slide, please. The Pareto chart is used to obtain the top categories that make up 80% of the results that have been determined to be a root cause of the problem statement. Usually a good set of one to three categories involves a clear source of the problem. So I'll just let you see how that one looks before we move on to the next slide. All right, the fishbone diagram is a listing that connects potential root causes of the problem. Multiple sources are listed here that involve our MVP, and we were able to use the process map and the fishbone diagram to generate our current process map. Mm -hmm. And then, um, next slide, please. Okay, this is Jay. Also in the analyze phase, the five whys is another tool that we use. And by using the five whys, we kind of peel back the layers of the symptoms. This helps us get to the root cause of the problems. We ask these problems until we get down to a common, the lowest common denominator. Parts break, why? Parts not on hand, why are the parts not on hand? Parts not in the supply system, why are these parts not in the supply system? Supply unit only has one shift. Why does the supply unit only have one shift? Now, basically, we get down to the excessive time between when the part is ordered to when the part gets to is received or gets to the aircraft. Why is it taking so much time? Next slide. Okay, this is our current VSM state. It captures the time of the aircraft break to when the aircraft is fixed. In the beginning, you can see some non-value added time from aircraft breaks through the troubleshooting. And we move on to remove the broke part. That's, t uh, that's value added time, because that's something that has to be done. The part has to be removed in order to fix the aircraft. Again, new part being ordered, that's value added. You need the new part to fix the aircraft. Within the ordering process, we have some non-value added times when dealing with the vendors. So getting the part to us with, from the vendors, with that part being in the supply system, from ordering the part is received a lot of the non-value added time. The end product of the aircraft is being the aircraft being fixed and returned back to a mission capable status. That value added time. Next slide. And this goes into our improvement phase of our make tools we use here, the lean theory of constraints, future value state map, exclusion and inclusion factors. Next slide. Okay, this is our process improvement goals. What do we hope to achieve? We want to reduce aircraft time, that the aircraft is down or non-mission capable, 
reduce the time that we're waiting on parts, reduce the parts delivery time, so the time that it takes the part to get from the warehouse to the maintainers. We also want to review process for continuous improvement opportunities. Next slide. Okay, this is our theory of constraints. Here we identify our most significant limiting factors, constraints that would prevent us from achieving our goals. The list would be the contractors, the contracts with the civilian vendors, the logistical aspects of the warehouse, you know, how they store the parts, how they deliver the parts, and the time that they get the parts to the maintainers. Next slide. Okay, this is our future state map. Here you'll see some of the Kaizen bursts. Those are the areas that we want to change. And those are the areas that we're trying to look at to improve on. Like for instance, the, the time that the aircraft breaks, that the part is removing. You know, if we, we thought if we divide the team in half, that the, half the team remove the part while the other half is remove, ordering the part, that would save some time because currently maintenance stops and everybody goes in and orders the part. And then all along our VSM, you can see our Kaizen bursts. We can describe the things, whatever we're trying to change there. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is our uh, exclusion inclusion factors impacting the improvement of our process map. You know, exclusion, scheduled maintenance, the inclusion, how maintenance shifts affect ordering the process. Inclusion is ordering the process on base or from the vendors. That's inclusion, FMC rating, and time needed for the aircraft when the parts are available and on hand. And the inclusion is the part storage and parts delivery times for the locations on hand and the base from the vendor. Okay, next slide. Uh, okay, that is it. Anybody have any questions? Okay, I've got uh, 8.35, so that gives you, well, okay, 20 minutes, I guess. Uh, let's see, let's see here. All right, what I'd like for you to do, I'm going to ask each one of you to uh, do a self-critique of your presentation, uh, not only of what you presented, but also of your teammates. Um, and I ask you to be, you know, critical. Uh, what do you think went well? What do you think uh, could be improved? Um, and then also what you may have learned from the team experience would be the last question I have uh, for all of you uh, after we do that. But uh, so, uh, uh, let's see, uh, who would like to start? Well, maybe we'll go on in sequence. Uh, Meg Megan, you want to? Um, let's see. If I have to critique myself, it probably wasn't the best because I probably didn't get my 100% focus. Um, just because you know where my son got sick last night. And I think it's kind of difficult because sometimes, you know, we don't always have a lot of time to prepare before we present our presentations. And so I think it makes it sometimes difficult and I don't guess it gives me enough time to really prepare because I'm more of a, I like to be over prepared and I always don't feel like I am. Okay. And I mean, I don't think we did a terrible job. I think, you know, everybody, <laughs> everybody did good. You know, they were able to present their slides and um, not, a, you know, people weren't reading off the slides um, like you had said when we first met. Okay. Thank you. This is Judith. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Judith? Um, yes, sir. Well, 
uh, as for self-critic, I would say yes, I definitely need to be a little bit more prepared in regards to the diving into the slides. And we know the data, we know the information. It's just putting everything into context and making sure that it's clear and concise across the board. And the key point is making sure that um, what we're talking about makes sense and reflects what's on the slides without reading off of the slides. So key things that I like to do is to read through the slides and make my own notes on how to best present the slides. So I, def I definitely think I need more time. I need more uh, to be more prepared with that because I feel more comfortable um, whenever I do a presentation, um, reading off of my own notes and not having to grasp at thin air, trying to get my thoughts in, in, in line. So that definitely helped. I did that today, but I definitely think I need to do more of that. Um, diving into the slides, writing down my notes, and do a little bit more research uh, um, in order to put everything into perspective, into um, more conceptual uh, things like that. As a team, definitely need more time to do proper rehearsal. Um, yes, the holidays really put a kink. <laughs> into the whole present pre preparation and getting us together. We were all, you know, tossed to and fro different places in the United States, overseas. So that really hurt us, I think. Um, but we pulled it, we pulled it, we pulled it through and I gave kudos to my teammates. Okay, thank you, Judith. Nicole? Um, I think I could have elaborated a bit more on the talking points. Um, yeah, and definitely I think I could have prepared more as well. I also think that uh, the presentation as a whole, I think I think we did well, not too bad. I do think we could still maybe uh, decrease the wording on our slides um, for the presentations, but I think that um, we all did well in terms of not reading off of the slides. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Uh, well, I'm gonna say practice makes perfect. I guess that was uh, evident with our presentation. We didn't have a lot of time to practice. And we got the slides out late to everyone. And I think once we, have that time to sit down and practice what we're going to brief we'll do a lot better it was good to see that the team my team is not as sh shy as they were before due to not understanding the military language or exactly what was going on uh, i was impressed with uh, the briefings from my teammate it seemed like they're coming along they're starting to understand and put it together so i was glad to see that but you said we need more time you know, if you sit down Make your own notes, and, and it helps with your transition, your transition process. You make your notes. It makes it easier when you practice. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, and I'm just uh, typing a, a quick thing to see if Matthew has any comments he likes to add in on this. Okay. Um, and I'm going to give him time to reply. Uh, let me ask you uh, while he's uh, seeing if he wants to reply. Um, how many times do you guys go through as a team? <laughs> uh, okay. You want the Air Force answer? <laughs> um, well, well, we... Yeah. I mean, we, we went through them yesterday regular... one by one. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, you kind of highlighted that on that, and let me see, um, and let's see, bring anything up, okay, um, okay, I haven't seen any comments back from him yet, uh, let me, um, uh, yeah, because this is kind of a, uh, you know, uh, again, because the, the school has a, instead of a thesis, you know, which a lot of master programs have where you have to write a long paper and 
have it all published. It's an oral thesis, basically your briefing, you know, what we have here tonight. And one of the reasons I want to have it at this point so that you can kind of see where you are and listen to yourselves as you went through. As you went through the briefing, did you listen or did you get any new insights or anything as you were listening to each other brief? Uh, was there anything you thought about personally, uh, you know, uh, as you listened to your fellow uh, teammates briefing, the things you thought about perhaps? I'm interested in what you may have learned just from the briefing aspect of this. Well, I think uh, during our, our presentation, we listed the tools, but I think we could show or, or brief how we use the tools. Elaborate a little bit more on the tools. Yes, I agree, Jay. Okay. Those are good comments, yeah. Because I'm, I'm very interested in that because uh, part of the, uh, you know, when you brief this back to a champion, uh to a client or whoever that might be you know this, this project you're, you're uh you're talking about the content for a large part but also if you can include in here here's what this tool does what its uh approach is and then explain it a little bit further uh well uh you're not only helping the champion understand but for the purposes of the school we you know part of my role is to ensure that you have a firm understanding of the tool and, and using it appropriately so uh, I would reinforce that. That'd be kind of a thing across the entire team that you have the ability to kind of talk about the tool a little bit more, what it is, what it's about, and that such. Uh, okay. Any other comments about uh, things you may have thought about when you were doing the presentation? Typing a quick note to Matthew, so excuse me for a moment. Okay. Um, okay, let me give you my impression then, okay, uh, as we went through it. I want to go through and I just go through a few of the uh, slides and then. Uh, comments. I agree with you. Uh, you are probably the more comfortable than I've ever heard you brief up to this point as a team. You guys were, uh, you know, talking how to flow. Uh, you had, uh, you know, information here. Uh, there are several of the things I want to highlight that I thought was really particularly good that each one of you kind of went through as you as you did your briefing. And then I'll give you some tips here about uh, ways to improve this presentation and also your individual understanding of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think your idea that, you know, the fact is that <clears throat> this is a, a different uh, business sector that most of you are in, uh, different operations, different terminology, uh, didn't seem to inhibit you as much as it maybe has before. Uh, and let me just say, uh, as you went through, uh, overall time, right, you had, you know, about 20 minutes. Normally teams are bumping up on the other side of the point and not having uh, enough time. In other words, they're almost right at the 30 minutes or plus. So you really want to fill up that 30 minutes because you've got a lot to cover. So explaining a little bit more about that. And the other thing I would recommend you might consider is that each one of you briefed your portion, but you didn't connect it with what was going to follow. And that's one of the things we want to uh, also include in your presentation uh, and look at some linkages. So I'm going to highlight some of those as we go through that that may be of importance. Uh, and then when you get ready for your final briefing, uh, because uh, you're going to have some additional slides, you, know, you really need to be precise about what you have. And so you can probably add maybe uh, two or three minutes on each one of your presentations as you're going through uh, to include um, uh, you know, the remarks. Uh, and I, I thought we had a great in, uh, introduction as you went through. Hey, what I really like is also you included some things in the uh, about the authority to improve. So you not only talked about the champion, but you also talked about uh, the racy uh, concepts. You know, does he have the responsibility for that to, to implement? And that was a, a good introduction. I like that because that's now including. One way you could have linked this a little bit further 
you could have said later on, Judith will cover uh, the actual roles and responsibilities and how each one of these are important. And we'll expand on that when she briefs you about some other uh, key members of this. And that's one way you can tie this in to your key stakeholder chart that Judith uh, uh, taught later. And see, this then allows you to have that kind of integration, if you will, between that. Uh, background, I thought you gave a good background on it. Uh, the DMAIC model, uh, overall, you know, here's the process. You know, talk about it, you know, uh, which you have. I like the which you included in here. There's a few things on this that we don't do, like the, the process FEMA under uh, here. We don't, we don't teach that there. There's a couple of things, decision-making me measurements. We really don't uh, have that a lot. But basically, uh, this is what the team is following. Uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, where are you in this process right now? Where do you think you are as a team? What, uh, what phase are you in? I think we're in between the analyze and improve phase right now. Okay. I agree. Okay. All right. Um, okay, let me uh, get my uh, webcam back up just in case so uh, you can see. Yeah. Um, yeah, and one way to improve this chart would be just to give an arrow or uh, something that says, here's where we are you know, right now in this presentation. And so you use it not only to show the methodology, but where you are, because this provides a pretty good roadmap about this. Wherever you're briefing, if you're briefing the champion, hey, we're so really clearly, here's where you are, where you think you should be uh, in this. So uh, that's one way to, uh, to improve uh, that. Define phase, okay. Uh, these are the, some of the tools, you got it. Strategic planning, CIFOX, CRM, uh, force field analysis, and there's a one other that should be in here. Anybody know what it is? Hmm. What other tool should be in here? You actually have it in your presentation. <laughs> Anybody uh, want to take a take a guess? Not the Pareto chart. Yep, yeah, Pareto, not in the defined phase. Uh, operational definitions and things like that. Oh, get some important ones in here. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, slide 27 which you have way back here in the improve phase. It says exclusion and inclusion. What is that about? <laughs> Are you talking about what's included in the project, excluded in the project? Yeah. Is that probably something we really don't need? So right here, this chart, because part of the thing that you want to talk about in define phase up here, um is that you're defining scope right you're telling what's included in the project what's excluded in the project yeah we're not looking at uh you know uh all airframes we're looking at uh the, just these we're looking at those for scheduled maintenance or on scheduled maintenance and so that type of discussion would be appropriate in a macro flow chart is typically part of that defined phase so uh, that would be in that chart that you actually have way back there, which you have inclusion and exclusion, uh, actually is a pretty good one that talks about that. So you, a macro flow chart would be the one you want to include also in your defined phase. Uh, here, uh, I thought you did a good job, and, and you know, here's what the, we are about. Okay, here's what our problem statement is. And this really is the only thing that you should refer to then. And I would include it when you talk about what your improvement goals are later on. It's your your goal is to do this problem statement, okay? That is your mission, okay? And at the end, you, I, as a briefing technique, I would just copy the same uh, problem statement and put it in the end and says, this is what our recommendations now saw. Keep this in focus, because this is what you keep referring back to uh, in the entire course of your project. This is what you're out to do. So you always say, hey, this is how this impacts this. 
you know, the readiness rate when we talk about customers, how are they currently impacted by that? Uh, so one of that type of things is that you want to do. The other thing you want to do is uh, never put in a demand model your solution up front. Okay, because what you want to do in your story of telling your project is saying this is what we looked at, and your solution is actually in your improvement phase, right? What you're recommending for improvement, and so you don't put it up front without showing all the data, all your good analysis, all the root cause analysis, and then out of that came a solution to address the problem. So just leave the problem statement stand alone and put your solution, your recommendation for improvement in the appropriate phase. So it's out of sequence uh, from that standpoint. But uh, uh, you did a good explanation. I thought, of, you know, the priorities here. Um, and SIPOC high level. Okay, you talked about the complexity. I think, Judith, uh, you were briefing this part. Um, and let's see, I also wanted to mention for a transition, and I think Megan, you had uh, uh, seven minutes or so. I think about what I had on my watch uh, for you, as you went through, and uh, so that um, is about about right. Uh, SIPOC, when you went into the Judith, I thought that you know you talked about the complexity of that, and one of the other things that SIPOC provides is a high level view of the entire project. Right, it shows all the different components in that, and uh, one of the things that you might, you know, include in, the, in addition to talk about the complexity of this, but also what's included, because part of the defined phase is talking about scope, and when you show the SIPOC, you're able to show to everybody what are the, you know, what are you looking at? What are all the things that you're, the suppliers, inputs, and I think the suppliers became a big part of the discussion, I, as I recall, as we're going through this, and uh, one of the things you may want to look at then is uh, as you talk about these customers here, and uh, then you talk to the CRM, which is right after that, uh, because you got support section, this and this. How does this chart relate back to your SIPOC? In other words, which of these customers are most interested in this? Because you talk about readiness rate, but is the support section, aircraft maintainers, supply maintainers, and this, okay, all interested in that, I would think, you know, they want to have a fully mission capable, but are there any distinctions between those customers? And which ones are these, are these reflective of all those customers? Or, you know, so you're kind of just linking it a little bit tighter with your SIPOC with that. And I know uh, when they had the, uh, the listings of this, they were kind of out of sequence, but it always is good for you to intellectually, you know, tie the customers that you got listed on your SIPOC to their requirements uh, here, not be just a technique to refine that a little bit more. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so you did this. I thought you did an excellent job on this uh, uh, stakeholder register. <clears throat> not only did you talk about, you just didn't say here's who they are. You talked about which ones are most important, right? Uh, you talked about, you know, uh, a lot of things that you withdrew from that about the importance of the people on this chart and how you were going to manage them. Uh, that's a very good technique. I, I like that a lot. That was uh, uh, well done and, and that you talked about uh, that area. Uh, what you can do is talk about the purpose of a stakeholder register. You know, you had a project management class. Uh, this is, again, how you talk to each one of these tools. The purpose of the CRM is to get the customer's requirements. The problem statement is really your uh, champion's requirements. And then you should say, well, here's the customers our champion serves, and this is what they're really concerned about. And then here, what you're looking at then is the part of this, uh, you know, uh, requirements matrix is that the CRM, this is what we got to look at, where this is what we're going to focus in on, ensure we deliver on these requirements. Uh, the stakeholders, these are the ones we've got to deal with within the project, you know, so you talk about, uh, we use it for communications, you know, which ones are really important, which ones do we have to manage, those type of things, that's good. Force field analysis, I think you did a, <coughs> okay, a pretty good job with that. Uh, remember, it's kind of a, a living document. If there's anything that's going to be now when you do your improvements, okay, is there any recommendations you'll have later on in how you, you know, dealt with these restraining forces? And a lot of times this happens when you do your recommendations for improvement. This is what we well, I recommend to the champion how we change the status quo. We need to tell them about the importance of this. We need to have them communicate. Um, you know, uh, t tell them what the data that we collected meant, maybe tell them to the importance of it, whatever that is. But sometimes you use this force field analysis 
to go back through and review your recommendation and approve it and see if there's anything you need to address uh, to, to have that. Uh, so that overall, uh, again, uh, it's spent about the right amount of time. Maybe it could shorten up a little bit on this and just add a little bit more explanation of, of, the, of the things. Now you're in the measure phase. Uh, I think, uh, Dekala, this is when you picked up, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, in the measure phase, the current process map, uh, yeah, yeah, as is. Okay, one of the things you want to do is introduce, again, what the measure phase is. What's the purpose of the measure phase in a, in a high level? You're going to be collecting data about the current state of performance. That's all you're doing in the measure phase. You're going to collect anything that you can measure and have numerical indicators in it. And so the measure phase, if this is the transition part, and I would probably suggest benchmarking is not, uh, it could be, uh, benchmarking typically is between uh, the tail end of analysis or the tail end of, of measure and analysis because you're looking at your own processes, but you're also analyzing an external partner or information you found in a, uh, uh, a secondary, uh, secondary benchmarking. So you're actually getting information based on the current state, analyzing it, and bringing that back in. And so as a part of measure, you're not really measuring unless you're going to show something that says from benchmarking, we measure current performance. Okay. So by including that in there, that will give you guys a, a kind of a clue what needs to follow into that. you got a current performance map. But again, uh, the part of the scope that should be a part of the briefing back in define phase and says, here's our start point, here's our end point, what's included, excluded. The other chart would make a very good one for that. And then if you've got a current process, then what are you measuring on this? How did you use this in the measurement phase? Now, did you, uh, you know, look at collecting this information? But probably one of the first things you want to do before you even go to this chart is this. Move this up here. Uh, right after you do your measure phase. Measure phase. Huh. I'm trying to get to the, I'm, I'm, I'm moving around. Data collection phase right after that. Okay, so if you got the, the measure phase, I'm, I guess I'm not moving it right here. Uh, measure that data collection plan because it's all about collecting data. Okay, and now what you should show then right after this is all the data that you collected. Now, how much of this here, parts received late, parts uh, not, survey data, uh, this is all done. Uh, is there everything uh, collected on this done? Because it indicates it is. Okay. Do you have any charts on, uh, on this data here? Sir, we do. OK. Yeah. We have a, okay. It's called Health of the Fleet, and it has all that data on that. OK. Yeah, so what you should do, after you have your measure phase, this, then you want to show what data that you collected. So sequence rise, benchmarking wouldn't be the ones that you would do because this is looking out externally. Now, does this make sense? Uh, you know what I'm saying is that you know here's measure phase, current state, collect that, and then you show the data, and that benchmarking probably would be something that's further down into this. Uh, and what was the the thing that what was the the information that you had in here? Here's the topic, right? And then uh, the benchmarking findings, which I think are here. Okay. What uh, what what came out of here? Are there any recommendations uh, that came out of here? Because you got a lot of kind of the things in here. Could you put it in a nutshell? What are are you taking from your benchmarking research and moving into your improvement? Are any of these things in here? That you got from the benchmarking are now going to be included in your recommendations for improvement. Anybody know? Uh, have you thought about that? Have you talked about? Yeah, I think we'll have to go back through and look at that. 
Okay. Because see, this is where the analysis. What are you doing with this information? Now, what you need to do is say, okay, yeah, uh, we gained something that we're going to recommend to our. Uh, that's the whole purpose of that, uh, is to tell them. And then, uh, uh, so I would maybe, and actually, these things here, the Pareto chart. There's your data. Anything you got measures, this would be appropriate. Uh, you could include this in your measure phase as well, because uh, it's kind of a boundary spanner. It can go between measure and analyze, but basically. You need to explain this a little bit more and say, okay, here's the purpose of the Pareto chart, okay, and then bring out what is the purpose of the Pareto chart, mm -hmm. okay. You know, here's what its purpose is, okay. You got to talk about the 80 20 rule, you know, okay, and then say, okay, as you can see, the first three columns, here's the 80% mark. Our first three areas here are these, and this is what we looked at as a team. Uh, we'll show you the data that, you know, and saying, why were these? You know, but talk about how you collected it, and then talk about you know where are the eighty percent, and then what you did with that data. Okay, so that's that part there needs to come out a little bit more clear about uh, from the Pareto chart about how you used it and what does this data mean to you as a team? What did you do to it? I mean, what was the impact of that? Uh, so that's uh, it's structurally uh, appropriate. In other words, it's, it's designed correctly. Uh, but you need to include a little bit more, and I, I like the way you got, you know, uh, the titles in it. It's kind of self-explanatory, and each slide should be self-explanatory. But how you, you as a team are using this information uh, certainly can be expanded upon, because this is where your real meat is starting to come from, where the where you want to spend most of your time in your briefing is in your measures and you analyze and your recommendations for improvement, uh, because you got uh, a lot of good information on here, uh, and then here. Uh, how was this? Uh, how was this information gathered? Uh, you know, th was this from a team that we talked through the interviews? Uh, did this? Do you have any survey data? You know, how did you generate this? These things. Uh, the college, interviews. You know? Interviews. Okay, so you described that. How was the data collected? Uh, what's the purpose of the fishbone diagram? Okay, is to categorize information in a way to identify key causes. And if there are any way on here are more important than the other, so you know that type of thing. So you're kind of explaining it more, and then uh, then you say, okay, now later on we'll show you, you know, how we looked at a value stream map as our suppliers, or and then you kind of integrate this with what we came on afterwards. Okay. All right, and I think Jay, you picked up here, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So this part here, you talk about the five whys, which is part of root cause analysis, okay. Now, okay, was this part of the issue here? You had supplies and uh, parts not in the system, okay. Uh, and just tie it into this and say, okay, here's some key areas we, we talked up, and then here's some of the five whys we talked about. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, okay. Uh, all right, and how did you generate this? Was this... Uh, <coughs> Uh, with the team, or did you come up with it as a kind of individual? It, it kind of with the team. They would ask yeah, okay. me questions. They would always ask me why. Uh-huh. So okay. that's how we came up with that. All right. Uh, and then uh, your uh, current state. Okay. The, um, you got a lot of meat on here, right? You got uh, a, lot, a lot of value at a time and stuff, so you orient to this. Uh, and you got a lot of non-value at a time. You know, I was thinking as I was looking at this, this whether, you know, this chart, because you were talking about changes in the process, right, uh, Jay? Sure. Would it be easier to brief this chart or uh, uh, how about your uh, your flow chart? Mm. Where you're, I'm trying to see where your flow chart is. Oh, I think it's back. Okay, measure, measure. Uh, okay. All right. Is there uh, usually there's kind of a relationship between these two charts here, but the value stream map had a lot of information, and uh, so uh, with this then here, your Kaizen. These are the are, are the. Let me get to the area where you were. Okay, there we are. Uh, okay. Um, okay. 
Uh, what, what's the biggest thing, the problem, in a nutshell, do you think, uh, of, the, of the causes? Because uh, in value, in lean, you have like eight uh, categories of waste, right? Overproduction, you know, uh, you know, transportation, duplication, stuff like that. Is there any of those categories that are involved with that in here? Yeah, most, mostly it's transportation and time. Okay. That's a good summary. I would add that in there, you know, and to just say, hey, you know, we looked at the different categories of this and uh, transportation, and you and you talked to it, okay, uh, about that, and so this is collecting data. This is a okay. Now, is this a good? What do you, what do you think about the data? Is that good or bad? What do you got here? You got twenty-two uh, nine value at eighteen uh, eighteen days, right? Uh, I'm, I have to go through that again. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, and, and what you want to focus in typically on a non on the value stream app is your non value at a time, right? And if it's involved with transportation or duplication or excessive uh, inspections, uh, well, how do we reduce that? You know, that would be kind of the thing that you may want to do that. So, um, and uh, okay, all right. Your process goals are really a problem statement. Reduce this, okay, all right. And, and this is kind of a, because just stay with your problem statement. But here's the thing that uh, you were talking about. What are your recommendations for improvement? Are you, if you were to say it in a nutshell, what are you recommending to improve? Uh, like so I think the time and uh, our, our relationship with the vendors. Okay. Okay. And the reason uh, those are askew is are the vendors taking too much time? Yeah. I mean, uh, is it takes a long time from the transport, or is it long time from the order? Uh, <clears throat> between yes, the military and the vendors, we really don't have a a POC in the middle to negotiate that. Okay. Okay. So, what I would recommend that you have here, okay, because you got a lot of things that you limiting factors and things. These are also uh, contracts with the vendors. Okay, these are, could be things like on a fishbone, right? You know, here's a problem. Okay, we we update changes. Uh, we have logistical warehouses that uh, uh, you know we got inventories. So you got a lot of things in here. Instead of calling them theory of constraints, because theory of constraints really is about the slowest uh, element, you know, bottlenecks. Uh, and you got a lot of constraints, but they're not really kind of technically underneath the, the bottleneck, but rather uh, these are causes, right, that are part of the reason that you're not getting the result that you want. Is that, is that a fair yes, statement? Okay. That might even be, you know, you may even have a fishbone around these. In other words, high warehouses that were changing processes. And you would go back to your fishbone. It's a process-related thing. Uh, here is uh, maybe methods. Uh, you got methods for how you manage uh, vendors. Uh, you got people, utilization of maintenance people. So this follows uh, with fishbone really well. Uh, so you may, and don't be uh, worried about having more than one fishbone in your thing because you got a lot of good information in here. But instead of under theory of constraints, it may be more important, uh, better to portray this as a fishbone as a better tool, because uh, theory of constraints would probably be more about what is your slowest process. You know, what's taking the most time out of your value stream map of all these steps? Which one's the slowest one? You know, which one has the least value added time? And then you say, okay, how do we decrease that? That would be how, you know, you use these tools in, in a way. Does that make sense, or am I uh, getting overloaded here with you guys? Hey, with the, the second fishbone, I mean, what would we title that? What would be the title to that one? Well, th this would be probably part of the things, because you came up with these when uh, you actually, you can have it back when you had the other fishbone. You have a lot of things in it, or you can add these into that one fishbone that you have. Okay. <clears throat> but if more than that, you know, if you think it's distinct enough, you may want to just maybe make two of them. Okay. Okay. So. 
so some sequencing here on this uh, in the area right now you should be right about where you indicate it between the analyze and improve and what you should for your improvement uh, is just put up um, oh this is by the way operational definitions this is a good chart but it shouldn't be in the backup it should be over right after your data collection plan uh, okay because then you need to explain what operational definitions are. You don't need this one, uh, but uh, let's see. No, don't need that one. Yep, this would be a good one to have, or something like that would be, if you're showing your data uh, and it, it's pertinent to your, this would be part of your measure phase. This one, operational definition, find that, you know, these are things we had to define in order to measure, that comes into that, you should include that. Uh, you don't need to have this one in there. Uh, looking at scope. Okay, this is scope discussion, right? This is actually part of the define. So if you want to include the, the verbiage of this in your define phase, that would be appropriate. But that chart could be just a part of your narrative. You don't have to have it written. And strategic priorities, I think you already covered that. And uh, so there's a couple of things on the additional ones I would might recommend you conclude. This one, as I mentioned, are these things that are outside of the uh, the project, right? The things in the uh, am I reading this correctly that these things are included in the project? These are external or not included? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay. It seemed to me this is kind of a scope. Thing and what's included, not included. So maybe moving this one up earlier, uh, earlier up in your project. Okay. So I, I've covered a lot uh, about this as we went through this. And uh, what I'm going to do, I'll provide some notes to you in here about comments on this, but sequencing and just getting it clear and then talking a little bit more about the tools. <clears throat> and you need to have a little bit more about the data you collected and your uh, recommendations for improvement. <clears throat> Are you guys doing a pilot of any sort? Are you? Do you have anything that you're recommending that you implement in the next month or so and see how it works? Mm. Oh, we haven't discussed anything like yet. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, because you said, is, is it taking too much time to get the parks? It is. Uh, okay. One thing I could think of is if they could add another supply person. We, the supply person only covers one shift, and most of our maintenance and flying is during the evening and at night. So when the aircraft breaks, we've got to wait for them to come in the next day in the morning to order the part. Okay. Right. So if there's improvements like changing the shift or decreasing the time, you know, because you got a lot of non-value added time here, like you know. 15.7 days. If you have a way to just improve that, you know, by reducing duplication or improving uh, uh, availability of people, whatever that might be, you know, you certainly want to give yourself recommendations. And then when we look at the benchmarking under improve, if there's anything you got from the benchmarking that you're going to recommend to the champion, put that on a chart for recommended improvements. In other words, we looked at somebody else's process. We think they have a really great SOP on that or you know, whatever that might be, uh, typically you include uh, from your benchmarking as well as from your process analysis uh, recommendations in your improved phase, and uh, you put it on a one chart and then uh, run it through that way. So uh, I've covered a, a lot uh, here. Uh, let me kind of just go back to you guys and see what, what's your reaction and uh, what, what, what questions do you have? Uh, the first question I have is all of, is, you did record this, right? I did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You said a lot and I'm trying to remember it, but I'm like, I'll just go back and go through it. Yeah. No, what I'll do, I'm going to. Yes, I was trying notes. to take some notes. Yeah, as was I. Yeah. We still have a little bit more work to do, sir. Um, the main important thing, as Jay stated, um, we're all getting more at ease, familiarized with the data, with the information, the unit's problem set. And so the main thing is to, as you pointed out throughout the 
presentation, those things, those things that we need to um, discuss and uh, fix within the slide deck, understanding all of that and putting it the right way. Yeah, because one of the things that's really important um, is that when you get your data collected, you know, because uh, this was where your information should flow from. You know, what was the data? You looked at this, but you also looked at time. You looked at, uh, you know, vendors. There's a lot of other things you just told me you looked at that you didn't give yourself credit for in here. You know, uh, you looked at, uh, if I looked at your value stream app, you looked at time, I go to cross. Uh, so just in this addition to what you have here, and I suspect you didn't do this in June, July, because you had your lean class back in uh, late fall. So you collected some additional information. You got some fishbone diagrams where you, uh, you know, got some additional information on there. Um, so just kind of thinking it through about what's the story between all this, uh, it'll uh, it'll tighten it up. And then on your benchmarking here, uh, I really don't care who found what, but I do want to know what you got from your benchmarking, from your secondary or your primary. Uh, of all this, there'll be another one. And saying, what, here's the recommendations. Okay, you got findings, which is what you got from the benchmarking and then are there any recommendations and, we, you, and when you do the benchmarking brief by the way be sure that you include a definition of what secondary is you know we did this through uh, online research on uh, looking at uh, information available in the uh, in the public uh, we didn't do primary which is going out into another visiting another organization so you're kind of describing uh, and this is the same thing with each one of these tools what you did and a little bit more of those things uh, in your presentation will make it uh, demonstrate your knowledge that you have already uh, in a much fuller sense. Uh, okay, uh, other questions uh, or, or comments? Let me just kind of go around. Megan, do uh, you have any I don't have any other questions. I just have to go back and listen to the recording again to make sure I've captured everything I wrote down. Okay. Yeah. And uh, how, how's the, the sick one? We're on day two. Um, he tested positive for flu today, so I'm hoping he sleeps better than he did last night. He didn't sleep hardly any last night. Tough job being a mom. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Megan, you got anything else or any questions? No, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, Judith? Not much, sir. Looking at the the do outs um, in regards to um, getting the getting together of the teams on the survey and anything else um, within the slides. And um, I think we have uh, our marching orders set for our next meeting. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, Dekalo, thank you. Um, I have no further questions. Sir. Okay. Jay? Uh, I have no more questions. Okay. Uh, let me uh, check with Matt, Matthew here. Um, so, if you will, and I think uh, Matthew had proposed maybe by Thursday. I would like for you to, to get together, you know, after this, and, and then go through that consensus. And then send me that uh, that form. Uh, I'm going to be doing. I have to do grades uh, probably by this weekend at the very latest. So I'd like to have that as an input. Uh, so if you factor that in, uh, you know, as I mentioned last time, I'll send you some comments that are involved with this as well. Uh, but I would recommend that you do set up more than one practice. Right? Uh, you should be at a point where you probably have like a 45, 50 minute presentation. And uh, your your problem should be trying to will it down to 30 minutes, as opposed to 20 minutes, uh, where you have now. 
because you, you need to get a little bit more uh, about explaining the tools, as we've mentioned, and integration across these things. How does this tool relate to the one I'll show you later on? Uh, you know, the Pareto chart, you know, this is how we use it to focus on root causes, and then, uh, and then you brief and say, okay, Jay's going to brief you a little bit more about the five whys that, uh, you know, built upon that. So that you now are kind of talking about what the other person may be briefing, building upon, because that's the other part of this is how these tools are integrated, and that part uh, is kind of missing from your presentation at this point. So uh, you're going to have more charts than this, uh, where you want to spend most of your time. If you brief it out, it's going to be from the measure phase on. In other words, once you get through the the first part of the define, where the meat of your project is going to be is in your recommendations. I think you're going to get a lot from your cost analysis you're about to go into, but be really clear about what you're trying to improve. You know, is it time? What is your data telling you? What are the procedures? Uh, what's the specific things that you might help to improve the vendors? Um, and, and try to, you know, bring in and say, what's your data? What's your key root causes? And then uh, here's our recommendations. And you get a slide, just put on there. Here's our recommendations for improvement. And uh, that will help you a lot, I think. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you. And, uh, well, guys, uh, that, I know this is quite a bit. Um, you know, I appreciate you hanging in there. And, uh, let me know if you got any further questions. Uh, what you should do is upload this uh, to, into the tracker as well. You're going to be using this again. So a lot of things we talked about tonight, uh, we need to get cleaned up by the time when we get to MVP3. Uh, in, in your final briefing, because you'll be doing a briefing to your champion. We need to get written saved back about what you're going to recommend and whether he, uh, he accepted it or not. That'll be one of the things I'll, I'll tell you now that we'll need to have <clears throat> accomplished by the end of the Master Business Process 3. So I wish you uh, well in your upcoming courses and uh, appreciate you hanging in there tonight. Uh, and despite, you know, a lot of the comments about to improvement, uh, one of the better briefings I heard you guys do uh, but I think you hit it right on the head. I think you know what you need to do uh, as a team. So, good. Thank you, sir. All right. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a good evening. Megan, take care of that little one. Thank you, sir. You too. Good night.